is that Kimberly McCall lecture series is honored as are we all this morning by the distinguished lecturer for this year. On some occasions, one presents a lecturer with a variety of biographical data, a list of academic achievements, or professional qualifications. There are, however, stellar personalities of history whom one does not introduce. One does not introduce the President of the United States. One does not introduce royalty of the British Empire. One does not so introduce great figures if one had the opportunity of the Reformation, a great revivalist of awakenings. One can only present such persons to present them with gratitude to Almighty God for the sterling quality of their lives, or for the devotion of their service, and for the undimmed brilliance of their ministry. And so today I would not presume to introduce Dr. Billy Graham, but I do present him to you as the Lizette Kimbrew McCall lecturer, and in presenting him to you, I do so with gratitude to Almighty God for the authentic splendor of his ministry, for the gift of his grace and presence that he shares with us this morning. And as you come to speak to us this morning, Dr. Graham, I want to share with you a seal of Southern Seminary that you might remember us, and remember inscribed upon the very center of that, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished through every good work. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Dr. Honeycutt, Dr. McCall, members of the faculty, student body, especially first-year students, <laughs> and uh, fellow evangelist, it's a great delight and privilege to be back uh, at uh, this podium. It's been my privilege to speak here on a number of occasions, and I think on at least two occasions, to receive honorary doctor's degrees. And it reminded me, the first time I went to Cambridge in 1955, they told me to wear my robe and a hood if I had one. And uh, so I picked out what I thought was uh, the most prestigious one I had at that time, was from Baylor University. And uh, <laughs> so uh, when I went into the study, the uh, uh, clergyman who was then the minister of Great St. Mary's at Cambridge asked me where that hood came from. And I told him Baylor University, and he scratched his head and he said he had never heard of it. I said, well, it's the largest Baptist uh, university in the world. Well, he said, I don't think you better wear it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Dr. Honeycutt has presented me this morning uh, as a doctor, and I suppose in a sense I am a doctor that does people very little good as far as physical health is concerned. But uh, I heard about this uh, dog down in South Carolina. He was a famous hunting dog, and they called him preacher and this fellow used him every year and one year he went down there and they said oh no said we don't have a dog here named preacher oh he said you must have I've used him every year but I did miss last year oh they said we did have a dog here named preacher but some fellow from New York came down here and called him doctor and he hasn't been any use since <laughs> <clears throat> so Now, I had prepared a lecture for this morning entitled The Mission of the Church, but I was told yesterday by some very eminent professors here that uh, uh, it might be better if I just uh, preach to you. I don't, I don't know exactly what, that, what the difference is because I'm going to give probably the same talk anyway. <laughs> but uh, I remember Grady Wilson was out in uh, West Texas and he was preaching to the cowboy camp meeting and one old cowboy came up to him after him and had very famous preachers there, three or four thousand cowboys, and he said, Brother Wilson, he said, I sure do like your preaching. You don't give us no doctrine or nothing. <laughs> and that's about the way mine is going to be. I had, uh, earlier this year, I had a debate at uh, Cambridge uh, 
supposed to be a debate, it turned out to be a discussion with the former Archbishop of Canterbury on the subject of the mission of the church, uh, uh, Dr. Ramsey, Bishop Ramsey now. And um, I used to go by and see him many years ago when he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. In fact, I never went to London before I went to see him at Lambeth and he would serve me some tea and we had become good friends earlier when he was Bishop of Durham. And um, he took me to his little chapel and he always called me Billy G. And he said, Billy G, he said, I pray for you every day. And he said, here's my prayer, that God will bless all the things you're doing right and overrule all the things you're doing wrong. <laughs> and I said, your grace, that's going to be my prayer for you from now on. <laughs> now, you cannot be an evangelist without being controversial. And I suppose you can't be a theological professor without being controversial or even uh, the head of a, a theological school. The gospel itself is controversial. I found out in my travels, now I've preached the gospel in over 60 countries, that just the cross itself is controversial. But it also is the power of God unto salvation to all of those that believe. I want to take a text out of context, way out of context, if I might, because in the seventh, by the way, this Bible, I was asked already what this is, it's a Bible. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I got this in Paris the other day, and uh, it's uh, the new international version in paperback, and I hadn't seen one so pretty, and I thought that would be good to bring here this morning <laughs> to start my lecture. <laughs> but uh, in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, of course, is dealing with marriage. And for some of you, this, this little phrase might be applicable, where it says, time is short. Time is short. Now, the apostle, I don't think, was talking about eschatology. I think he was talking about the fact that our lives are brief. Someone asked me uh, a few days, a few weeks ago at the University of North Carolina, where I did give a series of lectures, they asked me uh, what uh, the greatest surprise was. I just passed my 64th birthday, and that had been in the press that I'd had a birthday. And they said, what is your greatest surprise in life? And I answered, the brevity of life. If I told, if someone had told me when I was 20 years old that life was very short and would pass just like that, I wouldn't have believed it. And if I tell you that, you don't believe it either. I cannot get young people to understand how brief life is, how quickly it passes. It seems like yesterday I was in school. You know, we have on television today the early Today Show and the Today Show and the This Morning Show and the Good Morning America Show and the CBS News Night Watch and NBC News Overnight and ABC News Nightline, The Tonight Show, Nightline, all the rest of it. And uh, Entertainment Tonight, The Tomorrow People, Education Today. Everything today reminds us of today and reminds us of the importance of this moment and of this hour and of this minute, Richard Picasco was a teenager who gave himself to Christ through one of our television programs, and today he's a young evangelist. I don't know. He may be here for all I know. Married to a Chinese-born soprano, a graduate of Juilliard. And Richard's father was an Italian tenor who got depressed and jumped in front of a train. And Richard also tried to commit suicide, having gotten into trouble with the law and on drugs. Then he gave his life to Christ. And at a youth meeting, he gave a testimony which went something like this. As the world turns, I, the young and restless, was in search for tomorrow. But alas, I was on the edge of night, in a secret storm, in the hands of the doctors, in a general hospital, headed for another world. <laughs> then the guiding light said, you have only one life, so give it to me for the days of your lives. And since that moment, he said, I've been going with Jesus Christ all the way. I graduated from college 40 years ago this next year. A war had just started. We had no television. Nobody had ever heard the word television as far as I know, and I took a course in physics. And no jets. We went by train and bus everywhere, or drove a car, if you had one. No such thing as a Holiday Inn. 
No McDonald's hamburgers. I don't know how we made it. <laughs> no Kentucky Fried Chicken, no pizzas, no interstate highways. Elvis Presley was just a little boy. The Beatles had just been born. Never dreamed of a space shuttle. Roosevelt was, seen, was still president. It seemed like he was going to be president from then on. And most of you were not born that are here today. And how quickly the years pass. The atomic clock at the University of Chicago last year, that clock was moved from nine minutes till 12 to four minutes till 12. And, we were, and they were meeting at Banff in, in uh, Alberta. And I talked to some of those scientists that moved the clock because we were holding a meetings in Calgary. And I talked to some of them in the hotel. And they say, I said, was there a debate about it? He said, yes. There was no debate about moving it, but some people wanted to move it to one minute till 12. And then it reminded me of the little girl. The clock had struck 13 times, and she said, Mother, it's later than you think. And it's later in your life and my life than we think. I was looking forward to seeing Great Enough when I came up here. Now he's in eternity. He never dreamed when he got on that airplane that that was his last moment. We never know. You know, in the days of Christ, as fast as they could travel was by horse or a camel. By 1830, an engine faster than a horse had been developed. By 1910, a military aircraft could go 42 miles an hour. I flew back the other day from Europe on the Concorde in three hours and 15 minutes. And now the Columbia space shuttle goes 18,000 miles an hour. And we're trying to run a space age on a in the debate in the House of Representatives yesterday on the MX. We heard various viewpoints expressed. And one of those men asked this question, is World War III in the making? I have to answer yes. Unless we can pray and do something about it, and unless God intervenes, man with his heart filled with sin and evil and hate and lust and greed has not changed, and instead of swords and spears in his hands, he now has atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs and biochemical weapons that can destroy the earth in a matter of hours. What are we going to do about it? The explosive points in the world that we read about every day, whether it's in Poland or El Salvador, the Middle East, or Somalia and Ethiopia, or Southeast Asia, or the Iran-Iraqi war, or the situation in Lebanon which is far from resolved. How much longer do we have? Orwell's 19... 84 is just a little over a year away. Man is the same today as he was in Jeremiah's day when he said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. If there was ever a time for the gospel that can transform the human heart, it's now. The bomb did not make itself. The bomb will not explode itself. It'll be man. And man has to change. And the only power on earth that can change man is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord said you must be born again. First, there's the brevity of time, the Bible teaches. The brevity of time. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch four hours in the night. One day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Like the grass we spring up, and like the grass we are mowed down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Every one of us here has been given the same amount of time in a day. 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours per week. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength there are fourscore years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we are passed away and cut off. Seventy years God allows us. And it's interesting to me, with all of our medical science, we've never passed that magic mark. The average American male today lives 70 years and four months. The average female, 73 years and six months. More people live to be 70, but the average age of an American is still 70 
as taught in the scriptures. Now, 70 years God allows us. Let's think a moment. What do we do with those 70 years? The first 15 are spent in childhood, or the tw and then 20 years we sleep. And then the last five years, physical limitations are curtailing your activities. They haven't curtailed mine yet, but I, I, my fifth year till 70 starts next year. Only 30 years left, and part of that time must be spent in eating meals, working, and figuring out your income tax, things like that. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The brevity of time, that brings us to the urgency of time. The Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. And the days in which we're living are very evil. I've just come from Czechoslovakia and from uh, East Germany. And uh, just six weeks ago, I had the privilege of uh, preaching in Luther's uh, great pulpit, the city church in Wittenberg, and afterward to take a stroll of the city with the burgomaster, the mayor of the town, and then he gave us a marvelous lunch under the castle in a, in a gorgeous restaurant. And he had, uh, we'd already, with the city council, we'd already had a, a good talk, and they all told me that they were communists and they were atheists and so forth and so on. They got that out of the way, then they could talk freely. And we had a wonderful time of discussion back and forth. And I had preached that morning on Luther's faith. And I'd finished studying the life of, of Luther and read a number of biographies of Luther. And the depressions he went through and all the different struggles he went through and all the things that Luther said and did in his table talks. I went into the room where he, he gave his table talks to his students. He never dreamed that they would take... Uh, not tape recording, but writing all that stuff down. They were going to publish it someday, and some of it sounds rather primitive and crude, but it's very interesting to see the working of that man's mind. Did you know that Luther, at my age, had already been dead nearly a year? He accomplished all that time, younger than I am right now. Changed the course of history in that short time. Did you ever hear how he got his wife? Anybody ever tell you? He got some priests talked into getting married because he didn't think a man ought to not be married. And he was 41 years of age, so he sent over to a place where they were training nuns and kidnapped seven nuns and put them in barrels and got them out. And then six of them married priests, but one of the priests backed out or something happened. And so Luther said, well, to be honorable, I better marry her. So he married Katie. And he said, boy, he said, the first year of marriage was the worst year of my life. He said to have pigtails on my pillow when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> but in those days, they were very evil. The days have always been evil. Evil and good struggling. The forces of the devil and the forces of God locked in combat that ends up in every generation, it seems, in war. I've come from an area where they fought the 30-year war between the Catholics and the Protestants in Bohemia and Moravia and Slovakia and all that part of Europe. And they still talk about the 30-year war as though it were yesterday, and it was back in the 1600s, ending in the great battle at White Mountain where the Protestants were slaughtered. And what a, what a thing it is when you think that you have just one short life to spend and it'll soon be over. I heard about a man some time ago on the West Coast. He was in a Methodist church, and he decided that he was going to tithe his time. He would give 10% of his time to the church by going and visiting people. He led 20 people the first year to Christ, 20 new people he led into the church. Suppose all of our members tithe their time to witness for Christ as we tithe our income for the church. Then there's the tyranny of time, and this is one of the problems with me. Time runs me. The schedule that I've tried to keep the last six months is the heaviest schedule of my entire life. I don't know how I got into it. I don't know how I ever accepted so many things, but I did. And somebody asked me uh, some time ago at some university or seminary where I was speaking, they said, what is, uh, if you had it to do over again, what would you do? I said, I would study more and speak less. I have let people pull me to every type of thing in the world to speak 
and I needed to be on my knees in my study. And I would say to, your, to the students, get all the education you can get. If I, I believe in the second coming of Christ. If I thought that Christ was coming back tomorrow, I wouldn't change one thing if I were you. I'd just study. If that's where God led you and you're in the will of God, study. But while you're studying on the side, study the word of God for your own soul. Not just for classes, not just for grades. Fill your heart with the word of God. I've found that those who know the scriptures are the ones that have the power today. Amen. I have a daughter. She never went to college. She never went to Bible school. She never went to seminary. But she teaches the largest Bible class in the state of North Carolina. And she studies 23 hours a week for that three-hour Bible study. And she has 500 in her class. And she has several hundred on the waiting list that cannot get into her class. Why? Because she's filled with the Word of God. And you can ask her any chapter in the Bible, any chapter in the Bible, and she can outline it for you. And, she, and when she stands up to speak, she never uses a note. She has gotten that Word of God so in her heart and mind. Not only has it transformed her life and her family, but it's her whole community. And people, I, I, you know, one of our senators wrote the other day and said, two of my daughters have accepted Christ in your daughter's Bible class and I asked for the privilege of going the other day because they don't allow visitors and they don't allow men. But he went and he said, I went out of there with tears streaming down my cheeks from what I heard. The word of God filling your heart and your life. Yes, it controls us. Time controls us. Older men leaving their wives for younger women. How many letters a day we get like that in our office in Minnesota? Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him that sent us. The night is coming when no man can work. The night is going to come in your life. Yet there was a serenity about the work of the Lord Jesus. It's the quality of life, not the length. Jesus only had 33 years. And it ended on the cross. To the world, he was a failure at that moment. Yet at the end of his life, he said, I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. It doesn't matter whether you live another year or two years or five years. I heard about the preacher that was up preaching, and he asked how many in the congregation wanted to go to heaven, and every hand was lifted except one fellow back there. He said, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yes, sir. But he said, uh, I thought you were getting up a load now. <laughs> we, we never know. Will your work be finished? Is there a quality to it? Is there a dedication to it? Time can also be a tool, but it can also, we can also be its slave. And you know, I think if I had life to start over again in seminary like you are here, I'd write down my priorities in life. And I'd get committed to certain priorities. I'd try to carefully plan my life like Albert Schweitzer did. I admire that part of his life where he carefully planned it. And then he lived according to that plan. Redeem the time. The days are evil. The time is urgent. And then time also calls for immediate action. The fact that time is short calls for something now. Now is the accepted time. doesn't apply just to the unconverted we talk to. It applies to us as believers, to us as young clergy. Now is the accepted time. The things we ought to do, the classes we ought to take, the books we ought to read. Do it now. The family that needs you, spend more time now. Write that letter home now that you've been meaning to write. Money you ought to give, give now. Time for study, do it now. People you ought to witness to, do it now. Every time the clock ticks, it seems to say now. Today, if you will hear his voice. There may not be a tomorrow for you and for me because there's a warning to time. Time is running out for all of us. Time is too short for indecision and vacillation. Do not halt between two opinions. Fools say that time is long. Every morning we have 86,400 seconds to spend and to invest. And each day the bank named time opens a new account for you and for me. It allows no balances and no overdrafts. If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. 
We were, do you know where more Baptists are located than any other place in the world? Now, there are church historians here that will probably write me strong letters after I say this, but the most Baptist I ever saw, let's say, is up in northeast India, in Nagaland. And I went there for their 100th anniversary of Christianity in Nagaland. And the, the Baptist had cleared off the roads for us. They'd cut down the trees, and they had uh, soldiers behind us with machine guns and soldiers in front with machine guns. And uh, uh, it was really a Baptist procession from, uh, <laughs> from the airport to Kahima, which was, I forgot how many miles it was, but they'd had a lot of people killed on that road just in the last few weeks before we got there. And so Kohima is way up in the mountains, and these people, these Naga people are lovable, wonderful people, but they're a warrior people. And they were in really a war with India. They'd taken on all of India if necessary, but they're a state in India trying to get their independence. And so when we got there, uh, they uh, said that their first service was going to be in the morning at, uh, before daylight at 5 in the morning. And they said, Dr. Graham, we're expecting you to teach the Word of God at that time. I said, well, look here. I said, how about some of my associates taking that? I said, uh, I've got two other services tomorrow, one at uh, noon and one at, in the evening. I said, I'll, I'll take those two, give that early morning service to one of these others. I said, this fellow here, Charlie Riggs, is one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. I said, how many do you expect? Oh, they said, we, we'll have at least 100,000. I said, I'll take that myself. <laughs> uh, but they took, us to a, they took us to a graveyard, and here were all the tombstones of the soldiers because they had stopped the Japanese at Kohima from any further penetration of India during the war. That was the great battle that stopped them. And here were all the Americans, the British, the Indian graves there. And on that great monument that they have there, the people from the grave are saying, we gave out today so that you may have a tomorrow. Many films are being made right now, according to the New York Times, called Armageddon movies that will be released next year. And the scripture says, seeing all these things shall come to pass, what manner of person ought you to be? What manner of person should we be? I'm going to talk on that tonight. A man for all seasons. And tell you some of the, my own personal experiences in my walk with God. And talk about what kind of a man or a woman God can use in the present generation in which we live. Betty Liddick pointed out in the Los Angeles Times the other day, they drink like there's no tomorrow. Somebody wrote in the French paper the other day, Europe is like a person on the Titanic. A pop song some time ago said, another time and another place, and that's what the devil says. Another time and another place. The Gallup poll has just come out in the P Princeton Religion Research Center's report. You ought to get it and read it. It'll be in the library. It's called Religion in America. It's the most comprehensive thing I've read put out by the Gallup poll on religion in this country. And I was appalled at how few professing Christians read the Bible daily or pray. And even more appalled at how few have daily devotions. I don't know how we can claim to be Christians and not have any walk with God. I'll tell you, if you lived in Czechoslovakia and you were a Christian in East Germany, that would be the one thing you'd do every day. You'd pray. People ask me, do I feel that people are deeper in their faith in those countries than here? I say yes. Where the pressure is the greatest, that is the deepest walk with God. We have pressures, you have pressures, a different kind of pressure here. But we need men and women who walk with God. And if you do that, you too can finish the work that God gave you to do. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thou wouldst take these few thoughts on time and help us to realize the brevity and the urgency of time. And may we invest what little time we have in the kingdom of God. For we ask it in his name. Amen.